Thanks a lot, Steve, and welcome everybody. And a big thank you to Jeff, Billy, and Mike for joining us. Very excited to talk about the miracle of Maccabi hockey. And I think so everyone knows the format tonight. I'm gonna to ask the three uh, questions about their Maccabee experience, and then I'm gonna to talk to them about their life after Maccabee. So I'd like to start first with Billy. How did you get into playing hockey? Was it always your primary sport? Uh, definitely always my primary sport. And I got into it um, for all the old folks out there because of Peter Puck. Uh, if you remember, Peter Puck was from NBC Sports, used to be um, on at the NBC Game of the Week. And for some reason, it resonated with me. I used to sit down and watch hockey. Um, I believe it was a milk crate. I think my parents are on this. I mean, what Jewish parent wouldn't be on this? But, um, you, you know, I, I think this, if I'm wrong, they'll tell me I'm wrong. But I think I used to take a milk crate and, and just mesmerized by hockey. Jeff, I couldn't wait to play it. And then I played it when I was four for the first time and I hated it. I cried my eyes out because I couldn't skate. Some would argue still can't skate well. Um, and uh, I wanted to come off the ice. Long story short, my father turned me around and told me to get my backside back on the ice. And the rest is history. But that's how I, it's Peter Puck. I mean, that's what that's at least what I remembered. I just I would sit in front of the TV and just mesmerized by hockey. Just absolutely loved it. That's great. How about you, Mike? Well, <clears throat> one of my sports was baseball. I grew up playing baseball in Detroit. So I grew up in Oak Park, Michigan. And behind us, we had a baseball field. And I play a lot of baseball, uh, t-ball growing up. But then my uncle took me to uh, the uh, back then the Olympia. And I went to my first hockey game with the Detroit Red Wings and I fell in love with it. So I begged my parents to play. And I ended up getting the Kmart gloves, Kmart skates, old Cooper stick with the big knob on top. And I call it not really learn to play, learn to fall. So I struggled out there, but I really enjoyed the game. And coincidentally, my first team was the Oak Park Rangers when I was a kid. So I uh, started playing, just loved the game, had passion for it, enjoyed it. And, you know, the rest I started, uh, you know, I finished baseball when I was about 13 because I, re I really loved it because it was hard to play hockey and baseball at the same time because especially if you try to play high school baseball, it just doesn't work out. I still tried out for the high school baseball team and made it in my city, but the, because we played spring league hockey, they, they didn't really buy into that. I had to be at all the games. And from there, I just started playing hockey and went to Canada when I was 16 years old. And uh, Billy's rival, I was, gonna, I was going to play for Michigan State. I committed. And it just, uh, the way it worked out, I ended up playing uh, major junior hockey instead but I recommend every young player to go to college nowadays, but I ended up uh, going a different route. And from there, the, the rest is history. Thanks, Mike. How about you, Jeff? Um, I, um, my mother was, uh, was wonderful at taking uh, me out to skate when I was young. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and uh, she took my sister um, and I to uh, Nick, the Nickel School Ice Rink, which is just down the, uh, the street from our house. And took us to some open skating sessions and we both kind of fell in love with skating. My sister became a uh, nationally ranked figure skater and I, uh, I took to hockey. And the other interesting thing at that time in Buffalo was that the Buffalo Sabres used to practice every morning um, at Nickel School. And so after my nursery school, my mom would bring me over and I would watch the team practice. That was back in the, before the Mike Hartman Buffalo Sabre days, that was the, the days of the French connection uh, Perot, Martin, and Robert, and uh, they were just incredible to watch. And I fell in love with that team. I fell in love with the sport, and uh, it's it's been a passion for mine uh, ever since. Thanks, Jeff. So the next question I'll ask all three of you: we'll Start with Billy. You were all at different stages of your life during the 1997 Maccabee. How did you first hear about the games, and where were you at that stage of your life, professionally or athletically? Um, you know, I. I can't remember if, I think Hardy might remember this better. I don't know if Hardy, if you reached out to me or if somebody else did, and then you and I talked before that, I may have heard somebody, Jeff, it's a bad answer because I should remember, but it's been a while ago. I, I found out about it via some publication or again, Hardy, one of the two. I know I talked to Mike early on, very early. And we talked before the team met in, in Michigan for what would be our first skate or as a tryout, I guess. Um, where was I? I was 
I was, I was, when I say I was done playing, I was playing in a, in a glorified, um, I wouldn't call it slap shot league, but I was playing in a glorified senior league with awesome players, all former college players, major, junior, junior, a, whatever. Um, and we would kind of barnstorm around the country, albeit as our passion, not our job. Often we never got paid to play in it, but we got stuff paid for. Like if you gave us a case of Milwaukee's best, we were happy, but you know, we just had a good time. We went all over to, you know, Alaska to Minnesota to play all over. Anyway, I was doing that. And this opportunity came along and I remember going out for the, the tryout and most of the guys were there, but not all. And I remember Mike and I had a long talk right there and, and we bonded quickly there. And I met the, all the other, you know, some of the other guys and, you know, with shoe and everything, I'm like, yep, I'm in all good. Let's do this thing. And I had no idea what that meant. To be honest with you at the time. I had no hockey in Israel. Sure. Yeah, okay. Whatever you said, that's what I said. Let's do it. Thanks Billy. How about you, Mike? Well, I, was playing for Hershey in the minors. I actually uh, was, I went to Colorado's training camp and signed a contract and I thought I was going to be done the year before, but ended up uh, sticking it out one more year. And I went to Hershey and I said, that's, this is going to be my last year. And I ended up tearing my stomach muscle in Colorado's training camp, played a couple exhibition games. And I went to Hershey and I finally had the surgery and I knew I was going to be done. And a gentleman by the name of Sam Greenblatt called me. I've known him ever since I was seven years old. I used to go to a sporting goods store. And he said, would you like to go to Israel? I said, well, at that time, I was a little reluctant, a little nervous. I said, well, is it, you know, how safe is it? And he says, oh, it's, you're safer over there than you are in New York City. And I said, okay, count me in. He says, we're going to take a team there. We're going to go to Matula. We have guys, uh, some really good players like Billy Jaffe, played for the University of Michigan. And we had this kid Duberman and Justin Kearns and Jeff Schulman who played and we're bringing him out of retirement. And I said, well, I like to play still and have fun. So I like to be a player coach. And then Billy is right. I, I, I got to talking to him on the phone and I said, this is a, what a great character guy. I said, you know, Billy, you know, you should be the captain of the team, you know, and, and just help me with this because we did it together and we wanted to play out everybody equally, but at times, uh, cause it was a fun tournament. I, I really had a great time and great memories, but I just, the one thing I remember was Canada went there with Jacques Demers in a powerhouse. We didn't expect <laughs> it. I mean, they had the uniforms, pregame meals where we just wanted to, you know, go on the banana boats, make an experience of it, have fun. <laughs> And they're out there cross-checking guys. Uh, you know, it, it was like, wow. So we didn't, I, I, I felt at that time, I didn't want to put the real, we had some high school players and kids that were coming up and parents really wanted to see them play, but I was afraid to put them into that game only for that reason was I didn't want these kids to get hurt. And Jacques Demers has five, uh, six defensemen all over six, two playing in the OHL, playing in the minors, uh, Nemirovsky bringing them out. Uh, had a tryout with Florida in the NHL. And I said, well, and Brian Wilkes who played in the NHL and these guys went over there and they meant business. So I love the fact that we had character guys like Billy. Thank, thank goodness for Billy and Jeff. And I'm not just saying that because they're here. They're two of the older guys that, that really helped me with this because our hands were full and it was the first experience. So uh, th those are the great memories I remember of, of the hockey part can, of it. Can Billy, I say one I thing about Marty? Said, yeah. Real quick, so Hardy takes matters into his own hands. Shoe, you remember this in the first game? So Mike <laughs> says, you know, because Canada's out there, I mean, and they're like, we were like the Mighty Ducks, you know, before they became the Mighty Ducks. We were like, you know, before they did the Flying V, we were like, oh my God, watching them play. Well, we go into the first game and it may have been a practice game. I think it was the exhibition game or whatever. Hardy, you got into a fight with their captain, right? You got into, uh, with uh, Harold Hirsch. I believe it got right. A well, wrestling and, match, kind of, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, and and it was it was like whoa, game on, and all of a sudden, hockey was in Israel. It was like real. We were ready to go. It was it was. Hardy took matters into his own hand. It was like he was playing in the NHL. He wasn't going to let his team be intimidated. Great to hear that one. How about you, Jeff? Um, I found out about the Maccabee, uh, the '97 hockey uh, team, from my father, who was uh, reading a. Uh, Jewish publication back home in Buffalo and saw an advertisement that they were looking for Jewish ice hockey players and 
he knew one of them. Uh, there weren't many at the time, and he called me up, and I got really excited about it. I had, you know, Mike said, uh, coming out of retirement, I had graduated college in 1989, so I had been out for eight years and hadn't, you know, I'd been playing fun hockey with with friends, and sometimes I would get on the ice with with the EVM team just for fun, but. Uh, I, I had to sort of get get myself back ready to to play competitive hockey. And Billy, I remember the exact same thing when Mike was talking about about Canada and cross checking. It took about one Canadian cross check to one of our guys to sort of uh, to turn Mike Hartman back into the NHL player that he was. And <laughs> I remember a play with you go, going into the corner with the biggest toughest guy on the Canadian team, and I didn't even know what happened. Next thing I, I noticed, the guy was down and grabbing at his face and a couple teeth on the ice and uh, the, the, the tone changed in, in that uh, that game. And it's it's great to see just as I'm looking uh, on my my uh, Zoom squares here, some of my our teammates from, from uh, 97, Woody Levin, I see Jim Clapman, Aaron Vicker, and um, just, just such great memories from just, you know, the, the whole experience. And that's what's so special about the Maccabee. The sport is obviously a huge part of it. It's what gets us all there, but it's it's the bonding with Jewish teammates. In the case of a sport like ice hockey, I think all of us would, would acknowledge that you know, we played our whole lives and had only a handful of, of Jewish teammates ever. And then to be in Israel with a, a team full of, uh, of Jewish hockey players and playing against Jewish hockey players from all over the world, is that, that's the magic of, of Maccabi and the thing that really drew me in and kept me so involved uh, since 97. So I'm feeling a lot of camaraderie amongst the three of you, and clearly the team had it. Was it developed during Israel Connect? And also tell me about the experience in the competition, other than the cross-checking. What, what, who were the other teams? What was the level like? Start with you, Billy. Uh, definitely Israel Connect at that time. I mean, you want to talk about an amazing experience in so many levels. Um, I, you know, Jeff Hardy, I were all older. Dubes, uh, Justin Duberman, Heimo, older. So, so we could uh, experience everything. And oh my God, that was Israel Connect was. Um, I mean, Hardy brought up the banana boat. That was quite an experience. The river trip. We didn't make it down that in the boats. Um, where else? I mean, we just we went we went crazy. Um, I remember vividly too, Shu, you might remember this too. We had a kid on the team who was uh, from a mixed marriage and at the end of Israel Connect, he wanted to be part of the bar mitzvah and he wasn't observant at all or anything, but because of the bonding of the group, and I know some guys had been bar mitzvah, that he did as part of it, uh, 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 David Adler, a uh, wonderful, quiet kid who we got to come out of his shell. He's, in a, he's not a kid anymore, so I, I don't know if he's on or not, but awesome kid and I mean, everybody, uh, all the guys on, Woody, Vic, everybody, Jimmy, we had just a great, great time. And um, it was two weeks, of, or what was it? No, I mean, six days of craziness. And then it got even more crazy for the two weeks of competition. It's hockey's intense. You know, that's the thing. Like, I wasn't sure if, if the uh, USA Maccabee committee was going to really love the attitude of hockey players, to be honest with you. They have it a bit with rugby. Um, but it's still different. And we're kind of in our own isolated little world of the hockey business, so to speak. Um, and I, and I, I think that maybe they were not put off by us, but weren't sure as well. But then it, it worked out beautifully. And, you, and, and the talk about the competition, look, Jeff, it was, it was US and Canada. Israel um, wasn't, they were okay. I mean, you know, they're, they're coming along. They weren't great, but it was the US and Canada. We had a fourth team there that was a mix of state of countries and it was it was all right but look it was always us and canada already brought up jacques demers uh wasn't jewish still isn't jewish but that's the way canada played they brought along all the all the non-jews in the world because they could and that's the way they did it but you know what that actually fueled us even more we didn't beat them but you know what we we, we busted their butts pretty good in those games and they knew that they were in for challenges when they played us so that's what I remember about the competition. Before I go to Mike, I think Roy Solomon has to unmute himself because I'm seeing the thumbs down from Mr. Maccabi Canada right there. <laughs> nice seeing all of you. Can you hear me? Yeah, hear Absolutely. You, yeah. What's yeah. up? Great. Great seeing everybody. Yeah, Billy, it's a little bit different than what you're told, but I'm not going to go into it. I wanted to mention, um, do you remember Jean Beliveau? We didn't mention him. He was there. He was the honorary captain of the games. 
yeah. the great John Bellavo. It was a, but it was a wonderful event. You know, it really was a, a special first time for ice hockey. Being in Matula, there'd been uh, shells fired into Matula just two weeks before we got there. Uh, it was a very, very special time. And uh, just say uh, my memories are just couldn't be better. Remember watching all you guys play. Thanks, Roy. Nice to see you. So, Mike, before we go to you finally, I just want to let you know that J.A. Schneider has confirmed that it was Manny LeBranche from Team Canada. You broke his teeth. Well, if anything, I'm not, you know, this is, uh, I'm not, pro, I mean, you remember, I was just coming out of pro hockey, being in Colorado's training camp, and I just was the captain of a Calder Cup team. And, you know, I'm coming off a different intensity. I went over there with the idea, when they said, would you be the coach? I said, only if we could have fun as a group. And we toured the country. I don't know if the guys remember, we were, the first night was a Friday night and we were hearing uh, bombs dropping. They were practicing on the other side of the border. We were in Temple and all that was a great experience. We were listening to, you know, together. We, we, you asked if we bonded, there was a lot of unity between everybody because we just had to. And Everybody got along. Uh, let's not forget about Ron Gamer was a big part of it. He was yeah. uh, like the father figure there and, and we needed everybody. And, and it was really, there was rough going against Canada because I never expected that. I thought, okay, we're going to play hockey. Hockey's competitive, but I never thought they're going to have, you know, all this physicality going on with these. It, 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 that wasn't in my mind. That wasn't the mindset for me. My mindset was going over there and join the culture, uh, the, you know, waking up as a team together. I, that's what I remember. I don't even, you know, until the guys brought it up, I don't remember the, you remember it, but it's, it's not like all oh, the Canada was rough, but I just remember everybody together. Uh, we were just like going to camp together, singing on the bus, uh, being together. I was bouncing things off Billy and Jeff and say, okay, guys, you know, I'm, I've been out of, you know, I've been in, in pro hockey for a while. What, you know, let's, I just, came from from professional hockey so for me it was good that all of us uh, had this great experience together and I think it was fantastic I don't remember too many nights the other team we were playing Israel it was fun I remember the the European team didn't have enough players and and we didn't want to blow them out of the building we just we played fair we played okay guys let's not score 10 goals these guys are getting tired and we we played everybody and it was it was really a great time overall it was a great experience in my life for sure Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. It's really great to hear that you guys had such a great experience. The medals are nice. We want to win them. That's why we're there. But there was something bigger, and it's really reassuring to hear it from you. How about you, Jeff? Um, I mean, I just have incredible memories of the, of the whole experience. And the, we called it pre-camp at the time. Uh, many folks will remember that that was the name before Israel Connect. And it's great to see Roy Solomon, who I know was a big part of bringing uh, hockey to the Maccabee in 97, and Jordan Weinstein, who I know was big part of the U.S. team uh, back in 97 as well, and Ron Carner and so many of my Maccabi friends on this. But um, it was really, like I said before, it was just, a, it was a magical experience for me. And that, that, that those six days where we were touring the country and sort of bonding as a group was really special. I remember, and I've seen this in, in many of the games that I've been involved in since, that the athletes and the coaches and the teams, they get over there and they're so wired to like, they want to start practicing and training and that's what's on their mind. Um, and we were so, we were trying to desperately to find a hockey rink. And there were sort of rumors started <laughs> floating around that there's a rink, you know, Matula, where we actually played, many people on this call know, is literally on the border of Lebanon, you know, a good two and a half hours from where we were in, in Tel Aviv. So we, somebody told us there was a rink somewhere. We all piled in cabs. We had our, we had our gear with us. We showed up and it was like in a little mall. And literally the, the rink was um, like half the size between the blue line and, and the goal line. And we, we, we all sort of laced up our skates and got out there. We realized in about five minutes that this wasn't going to work. So we all got back in the cabs and headed back to the car. But um, once we got up to Matula, you know, we certainly took the hockey seriously. Mike set a, a great tone and Billy as well in terms of balancing the competitive part of it with the whole experience. But, um, you know, the Maccabee is just so much more than, than the sports competition. And that's, that's what makes it so special. And the, the, uh, the Israel Connect program is a, is a huge part of that. And it's something that's really unique to Maccabi USA that a lot of the other countries have, have started to take on. But it really, it really provides the context for, for the experience that, that we had. And, and again, being up in Matula is really unique. It's, it's in, in one way, it's challenging because it's really separate from the rest of 
the games that are that are happening in the central part of the country. And in the last the last Maccabee, as many people know, in uh, 2017, uh, we were able to to install an ice rink in the spectacular new arena in Jerusalem, which really has just transformed, the, I think, the whole experience for for the athletes. But it was pretty special up in Matula. It's a, it's a unique place, and we had a great great time. Thanks, Jeff. So the bonding is special, the experience is special, the competition is special, but maybe the most special part of the Maccabee is marching into the opening ceremonies. Tell me about what that meant to you, Billy. Well, we didn't get to a 97. That was when they, uh, the bridge. Um, oh, sorry about that. That's a new. That's, that, but that's, but, but it's worth talking about, Jeff. It's not a, it's not a, it was the moment of what's going on. And, you know, we're all over there. Um, we all feel incredibly safe over there. You know, all, within a day, I, I won't speak for Hardy and Shu, but, you know, you, you know, it's like, of course, you know, you're in a foreign country, you know, you're in Israel, but all of a sudden you're, you know, like, it's just calm, it's whatever. Well, we're staying in this, uh, what was the name? Um, I don't remember where the opening ceremony was in 97, Jeff, you might remember, but we're in this field. Ramadan, Ramadan Stadium. Well, right, but we weren't in the stadium. We were in this this. We were, this we were by the Yarkon, by the river there. Yeah. yeah, and we're waiting and waiting, Jeff. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, we start seeing people moving, going, helicopters, etc. And of, of course, a very sad event, a very, um, a very, a, a very, tr you know, very trying it because we're all wondering what's going on, and our parents are over in there, and we're over here, our families and general, and we're over here. So that was such a bummer not being able to go into there, but obviously with what happened, it was just, it was just awful. The good news is, is other times, Jeff, that I've been in it, walking into the stadium to the arenas are, you know, it's, it's awesome. It is the colors, the light, the attitude, the running up the ramp, the kind of in, you know, when you come in, it's an amazing feeling. It is. So Mike, how was it after the, the bridge issue, the disaster? Uh, how were you able to pull together, have the team pull together? How did you have the team deal with that afterwards? Well, I think even beyond the team, it was everybody. Like uh, there was countries uh, in front of us on, and there was countries behind us. And we, like, like Jeff said, we didn't, uh, it, or Billy said, we didn't really know what was going on. We just saw helicopters. We were, you know, a little nervous. And then there was word that uh, they might cancel all the games. They were talking about that. And you know, what we did collectively as a team, we, we gathered together with the, uh, with the older players and, and, and the coaches and we said, okay, and we just have to, you know, stick together here and whatever happens, uh, we just have to make the best of it. And, and we were sad. We weren't really thinking sports after we did find out what happened, because I think we lost five or six lives uh, in that incident. And it was terrible. It was something that, uh, that was just, uh, you know, something you don't really think about when you're going over there ready to march into the stadium. So uh, everybody gathered together and we, we said, okay, let's just, uh, let's just stick together as a team and whatever happens, happens. We ended up playing. It ended up uh, working out that way, but it was terrible what happened. And uh, you know, you, you never want to see anything like that happen for sure. Jeff. Um, yeah. I, you know, obviously my, that, that experience was, um, you know, was was um, just so tragic and so sad coming off of, you know, the, and, and people on this call who've been part of the Maccabee and know what the, that spirit and energy is like um, prior to the opening ceremonies, you know, when you're gathered with athletes from all over the world, and it's just in, this incredible tapestry of, of you know, different people's uh, outfits and um, it's just amazing and the energy and the spirit and then uh, to have this, this horrific tragedy, um, was, was just just awful and you know this was before cell phones were really prevalent so it wasn't easy to get information about what was going on and um but the word the word did spread and um we had that long uh, i just remember that long bus ride back to matula from ramat Gan was um you know was was pretty quiet as we were sort of taking it all in but um um and you know it's it's uh in my involvement in, in the game since then that's you know that that tragedy is something that's that's remembered at every games pan am uh, maccabee um as it should be because it was it was um it was really an, an awful awful thing to, to be a part of I, I heard the other day um 
I listened to uh, Doug Gottlieb, who did one of these programs. And um, I, I didn't realize at the time that he was part of the 97 games as well, but he, he talked about that experience too. And I think any of us who were, were part of it is something that we'll, we'll never forget. Thanks, Jeff. So I want to ask you, what was your proudest moment as an ice hockey athlete, Billy? Oh, man. I was scoring my first goal as a six-year-old. <laughs> I mean, I see, I can still remember it. I, I mean, at the proudest moment, um, I won a national championship with this team called the Chicago Chargers that was outstanding. I know, it, it, again, it was a glorified beer league, but the guys bonded with them. Some of my best friends still to this day, just like guys from the Maccabee teams. I mean, playing in the 97 games, I mean, my sister got me a gift years ago. The jersey's on my wall here. You know, you've got jerseys behind you, Jeff. That's one of my proud moments because you're representing your country, your family, your culture, et cetera. That was another great proud moment. Walking onto the ice for the first time at Michigan too. You know, hearing the, the band blaring, you know, hail to the victors coming down onto the ice. I'll never forget that. Um, a lot of those moments, uh, just little, little, little things like that, that you, I always think of that, you know, you, you say, well, you know, your, your hockey career was okay. It wasn't really much of a career when I think, you know, when I think about it, but you've had a lot of these little great little moments and that's those, those type of things still are in my mind. It's amazing that I can honestly remember goals that I score when I was six or seven, you know, like it's, it's amazing. And my wife says, I can't remember what I told her 20 minutes ago, you know, but, but I can remember those goals. So little things like that. Thanks Billy. How about you, Mike? I have some really good memories. Uh, it, I always, uh, my dream was to play uh, uh, one game in the NHL and it ended up, I played more than the one game. So I think that first game was exciting and, and playing in uh, Jeff's hometown, Buffalo, which was a, a, a really a fantastic opportunity. And uh, Scotty Bowman gave me a chance at a very young age. So I can remember uh, moments like that. And I had a lot of great uh, moments in hockey, but just the, the things I think about is uh, it's like Billy said, I mean, Billy did have a great career because anytime you could play, people don't realize and Jeff, how hard it is to play college hockey. I tell kids all like a lot today, like it's not as easy as you think. They don't just hand scholarships out and Jeff could speak more on that than I can. So uh, uh, Billy and Jeff had great hockey careers, but I always say life is built on relationships and the relationships I've, I've made along the way are important. Um, I haven't seen Billy in, in years and I've talked to Jeff maybe years ago. I think I talked to him about a young player that was gonna may possibly go to Vermont many, many years ago. I can't remember how many years ago it was. And I think it was the relationships that I made along the way that, that really were special to me. So the game was great. I mean, uh, some people, uh, you know, somebody said it best once, uh, you know, some people have a cup of coffee, some people have a pot of coffee, some people make it as far as junior, some play, Division one and get to play for University of Michigan and, and live in that. And so it was the opportunity just to play at a high level. Uh, it, I was fortunate uh, to do that. I was a very average player and I knew there were players better than me. And I just had the philosophy, okay, if I just outwork people and that's, uh, that's how, how I remember the game. And when it was over, it was time to, to move on to do something different. Thanks, Mike. Jeff, how about you? Um, I don't know that I have one, one particular moment. I, um, you know, I think listening to Mike talk and Billy talk about the relationships are, it's such a big part of sport in any level, especially a team sport like ice hockey. Um, you know, the, my teammates from college are some of my closest friends today. And, and, uh, I, I was, um, you know, I had a great experience playing college hockey at the University of Vermont. I was not much of a, a goal scorer. I think I scored six, six goals in my entire career. It was, Sort of the stay-at-home defenseman type, which is what they call you when you don't score very much. But I did score one one goal in the ECAC semifinals at the Boston Garden, and kind of a lucky slap shot. And so I tell our players all the time: if you score one goal at the right time, you too can be the athletic director at your alma mater. <laughs> but um, and from a Maccabi perspective, well, you know, one of the things that that I, I'm incredibly proud of is is being part of a group. And Roy was part of it, and Ron Carner and Jordan and and you, Jeff, and others leaders of Maccabi USA and Maccabi Canada and helping to bring hockey back to the Maccabi. You know, um, I saw one of the questions in the chat uh, was about why hockey went away after, after 97. And uh, it was a shame because it was, it was an amazing experience. And 
many of us worked really hard um, after that to, to try to bring the games back. One of the challenges, as we talked about before, the only ice rink in Israel at the time, there's more now, but was was in Matula and it was really uh, separate from, from the rest of the games. But um, uh, so I, I was involved in, in, uh, in 2013, helping to bring the games back and to be on the ice in Matula as an administrator at that point and, uh, and celebrate the return of hockey to the Maccabee was something that I'm, I'm really proud of. Great, Jeff, thank you. So Billy, I wanna ask you post Maccabee, you've had a very successful career as a hockey analyst and commentator uh, was it always your dream to work in this field? And tell us a little bit about your career journey to where you got to where you are now. I never thought to be in the field. I had never, in fact, it's tied with uh, my 97 experience. Um, I had never broadcast except maybe one game when I was done at college or done an interview with like the student network. But I was given an opportunity by um, a gentleman in Chicago who believed in me, and came to me the summer that I was in fact training for the play for, for, for Mike in the play with Jeff on the 97 team. And uh, he said, would you be interested in being part of the Chicago Blackhawks radio broadcast? And I was in the food business at the time and I was playing, you know, and that was, that was it. And I said, yeah, sure. What the heck? Well, fast forward to the end of the games in uh, I, I guess it must've been mid August. I had a, a fax waiting for me at home, Jeff saying, would you come in and meet with us? That's how long ago it was, you know, people were still using faxes. And um, I hadn't forgotten about it, but I hadn't really thought about it at all. And so I go in and I meet with the, the station's general manager and the uh, sports director. And they, it was like September 1st. And they said, would you like to try this? Because, you know, you've been recommended by this person. And I said, yeah, sure. OK, no problem. They said, OK, well, come on in for the uh, first preseason game. I went in 10 days later, sat there and watched and listened. And then two days later, the Hawks played St. Louis. And they said, you want to try it? And I said, sure. And I went on the air. And that's the start of my broadcast career. I was 29, I believe. I'd never done it really before. But it, I can tell you the reason I knew that I liked it is when I did it the first time, I enjoyed it. I wasn't nervous. And it felt natural. Did it mean I was any good at it? Probably not. But regardless, I was, I was, I was just happy to do it. One thing led to another over the years. Um, I did the Hawks. I did the Chicago Wolves, college hockey for Fox Sports. Uh, Atlanta Thrashers, now the Winnipeg Jets. Um, things happen quickly, crazy. I mean, some unbelievably crazy stories in my career, getting a job and two days later moving to Atlanta, literally, you know, on a plane going down there to do that. Uh, the New York Islanders uh, with MSG Network followed suit uh, with another crazy story. I mean, I've done national stuff with Versus, it used to be OLN, et cetera. Long story short, then between the NHL network and then finding my way to Sportsnet in Canada and then Nesson in, in Boston, it's been a, an amazing run. It's been at times bumpy. That's the life of a, of a, of a broadcaster. But when it's all said and done, it's, it's been phenomenal. I love talking about hockey. I could talk about it all the time. I, could, I love coaching hockey. All, I mean, I do it. My goal always is this, to take hockey, which is a real simple game, right? real simple game and to bring it and talk about what I saw, what we saw as a, as a broadcast team, uh, do it easily, do it with education and do it with fun and energy. And I always say, if I'm not having fun, then shame on me because all I'm doing is talking about freaking hockey. That's it. So that's my broadcast career. And I, and I, and I, and I do, I love it. And um, it's been a bit rocky lately with no hockey though. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you that it's finding different things to do has been different. Thanks, Billy. Very, very interesting career path. Uh, Mike, you were in the league 10 years. You played for some different teams. Tell us about which teams you enjoyed playing for, the culture of the city. Tell us a little bit about your journey in, in, the, in the NHL. I was nine, nine years, I think. Uh, I nine. played nine years in, in, uh, in the NHL. And uh, I started off in Buffalo, which was a very small place. And you're usually you're loyal to everywhere where you play, but Buffalo was very special to me. It was the first team that, that took a chance on me. I was drafted at 19 years old, not 18, not the traditional 18 year old draft. I didn't get drafted uh, that year. Uh, and I ended up going there and they gave me a chance. So Buffalo has always been in my heart. And then I went to uh, the, the Winnipeg Jets where a Jewish family owned the team then. And they're really good to me. They're the first team ever to offer me a four-year contract with four years of deferred money. 
with the Canadian taxes, but I didn't do it. Uh, it was a nice place to play, Winnipeg, uh, great people. Uh, it was the Shankro family, and I don't think they offered it because I was Jewish, but they, it was just a really good family environment to play in. They made it nice for the families because, you know, Winnipeg could be very cold uh, <laughs> in, in, in the winter time. And then I go to Tampa Bay, and I went to an expansion team, which was, was a lot of fun. And then I ended up at the New York Rangers, where I was really an insurance policy even when I got traded there, I sat out in the beginning and I said, oh, they'll probably get rid of me in the summer. And Neil Smith called and said, uh, we just brought in Mike Keenan. We're going to keep you here because we, we can add you in and out of the lineup all year, but you're going to be an insurance policy. And I accepted the, accept the role because back then we didn't have a salary cap and we had a team of all-stars. Uh, we had like seven guys in, from the Edmonton Oilers that won Stanley Cups to Greg Gilbert was the Stanley Cup winner with the Islanders. And so all, I, all the experiences were great, where it was a great experience. And then at the end of my career, I was offered to do some coaching. So I was a player coach in the minors and I realized I didn't wanna be in hockey. It's a great way to be in it. I had an offer from uh, a former organization, one of the NHL organizations to work in their minor league team and maybe work up as an assistant coach. And I thought for my best interest that I played hockey. I just wanted to raise the, uh, you know, raise my kids. I have a 26 year old who went to NYU in New York and I have a 23 year old that lives here in Charlotte. And for me, it was more important to, okay, I played hockey, I did it and it was time to move on. So uh, all the experiences were good, even in the minors, it was all great experiences all the way through. Thanks, Mike. So Jeff, the question I was gonna ask you, you just answered without me asking you in your last segment. So I was wondering if you hacked into my notes or something. So about hockey not coming back till 2013 and how difficult. So let's go in a different direction with you. Um, is it true that you were drafted by the Boston Bruins? That's true. Yes, I was. And how'd you find out about that? <laughs> so I was drafted in uh, not as part of the regular draft. But, um, when I was coming out of college, there was something called a supplemental draft because uh, each team in the NHL could pick one player um, and they implemented it because the, the teams were frustrated with the free agency um, landscape that had developed where players would, it could only be drafted either 18 or 19 and then they were free agents. And so players who would have good college careers all of a sudden you know, were creating bidding wars. And so they decided to create this supplemental draft at the time and each team got one pick and I actually, I graduated from UBM and had accepted a job as, uh, at the Eastern College Athletics, Athletic Conference, the ECAC on Cape Cod. Was all set to go. I actually had a broken leg at the time. I broke my leg playing pickup basketball. And I got a call one day uh, from a reporter from the Boston Globe who wanted to get my reaction to being drafted by the Boston Bruins. And I thought it was one of my buddies kind of pulling my leg. And I said, come on, what are you talking about? I'm not, I'm not playing for the Bruins. I've I'm accepted a job and no intention to play pro hockey. And so he wrote an article the next day, really critical of the Bruins saying, you know, what a waste of a draft pick. How could you pick the guy who's got a broken leg has no intention of playing professional hockey. And, uh, and then I went on. So I, and you know, we, I thought about it for a little while and just kind of decided it really wasn't for me. I mean, I, I, I knew pretty quickly what their plans for me were not, not to be uh in the NHL anytime soon. And so, and I was excited about moving on with my life. And so I took this job at the ECAC and on the second day I was there, the commissioner, you know, who I didn't have much interaction with came to me and he threw the Boston Globe in front of me and said, is there something we should be talking about? And it was the Globe story about the Bruins opening their training camp. And it said, everybody arrived for training camp on schedule. The only holdout is University of Vermont defenseman, Jeff Shulman, who's in a contract dispute. <laughs> he said, is there something we should be talking about? I said, no, that's, uh, <laughs> it's not really a contract dispute. The only contract dispute is I asked for one and they said no. And that was about, <laughs> that was about the dispute. But uh, yeah, that was, my, that was the extent of my, uh, my professional hockey career. But um, as Mike was saying, I grew up in Buffalo and obviously it's a huge part of my life and I love it there. And remember watching uh, Mike play for the Sabres and um, great memories of that. And so, um, but I, I had a great, great experience at, at UVM as a, as a college hockey player. It's fun for me to see one of one of our great fans, Barry Stone, is is on this uh, on this call. Barry was a great basketball player at UVM and played Maccabee tennis and 
a great friend of mine, a great friend of the university. So Barry, it's, it's good to see you. Thanks, Jeff. So Billy, Mike was talking a little bit the different cultures on the different teams. So you worked in Atlanta um, first, and do you think that could ever become a great hockey city? And now you're in Boston, which is the like an epicenter, hockey crazy town. Tell us about the difference, what it's like to work in Boston. Uh, well, working in Boston is phenomenal. My my mom's side of the family's from Boston, from a town called Winthrop, which is right next door to the city of Boston with a few miles. And uh, I grew up an enormous Boston sports fan because of my mom's mom and her passion for it. And when this opportunity came to me in 2012, actually the 11, 12 season, so right after the Bruins won the cup, um, it was something that, you know, I had kind of worked to create and then they came to me and said, yes, let's do this. It was, it was awesome. It was, Jeff, it was, it was just amazing to be a part of it. And then to move here a couple of years later, I was traveling. So I was still working with New York and I was still in Canada and this and that and everything. And so I was traveling six days a week. We decided to move here and I started doing all the, you know, many Bruins games as possible say, um, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, what a hockey culture in not just Boston, but New England. I mean, you know, when, when non-COVID world, you know, I would see Jeff two, three, four times a year based on college hockey because I do a ton of college hockey. So that's great here. I mean, the New England hockey culture is just, it's, I think it's every hockey person's dream because it's everywhere. Um, the Bruins, when the Bruins are good, I know that the Pats have owned this town, but when the Bruins are good, the Bruins are right up there. You know, I mean, that's where they are. And it is quite the contrast to Atlanta. Then again, Jeff, just about every town <laughs> would be the contrast to Atlanta. Um, they tried, ownership got in their way in Atlanta, quite honestly. They had a unique arena, great arena, I thought, but unique. Um, but, you know, it's easy to sit and play, you know, armchair, I guess, power play quarterback looking at that but I can tell you that eventually ownership got the best of the thrashers and that's why eventually they ended up leaving and being sold to to Winnipeg mm -hmm. I do think it could have worked again it's easy for me to sit here on the outside looking in saying if they had done some different things maybe if they'd put the arena in a different place if they had done a few different things with youth hockey etc because there's a lot of great hockey people I see J.A. here I I don't know if he's still down in Atlanta or not, but you know, there's people that have been down in Atlanta and, and he is. Yeah. I mean, we had some great, there's Kenny yeah, in the middle. So, I mean, we had some great hockey down there, but it got treated differently by the ownership group. And, and I, I've seen now, Jeff, how ownership, and it's no different than any business out there. I've seen how important ownership is. The one example I always use the Tampa Bay lightning in 2010 were no good. They're one of the worst franchises around. I hope I'm not offending anybody here right now, but I'm telling you, they weren't. They get sold in 2010 to Jeff Vinnick from Boston, who now moved down there, who turns the franchise around because of ownership. And they are amazing now. And they are looked upon as being the premier franchise or one of them in the NHL. So it's no different than any business than anybody else has. Ownership, it starts and permeates through the rest. So that's what happened in Atlanta. But I'm very fortunate right now to work in Boston. I do work a lot for the NHL Network, which is now stationed in Secaucus, New Jersey. So I'm down there a lot. Those are some great people there too. Um, and it's just, you know, when you're around great hockey people, Jeff, it makes talking hockey that much easier. Thanks, Billy. So Mike, I'd like to ask you a question. You're a very thoughtful, soft-spoken, bespectacled, nice Jewish boy. And you say you wanted to work harder and that's how you made your way in the NHL. But along the way, you picked up over 1500 penalty minutes. When did you know in your career that that was something that you had to do? Well, just to, to be straight up, when people say that they're not straight up, but I, I didn't want to be a fighter. When I played for CompuWare in Detroit, I played with some really good players. So I played with Jimmy Carson and on a good line, but I, I scored like 80 goals <laughs> and I, and I ended up scoring and, uh, and Sean Walsh, who, uh, who recruited me at Michigan state, he didn't recruit me to, to fight back then. And, and, uh, now he, he ended up actually leaving and that's when he went to Maine and, uh, now he's not with us anymore. He was a, a super, super gentleman. And, but when I went to Canada, they basically said, you have to play both ways. 
and you have to play physical and, or you're not going to get a chance. And a good example is one of my best friends, Nick Kiprios. He scored 72 goals in junior for, and didn't fight much. And the flyers said, we don't want anything to do with you. We need you to play a little bit tougher. And then he fought a lot. And I was with Alan May today for lunch, Billy you might know him. He, he came down, he's on his way to Texas and other, there's three announcers and he was a pretty good hockey player too. And they, they turn in that, that they turn you into that, but they want guys to do that. Now I wasn't very big. I'm barely six foot and I was a middleweight player, but I was a physical player that would hit and the big guys would come and I would defend myself. I mean, I had one fight when I was in sixth grade and my father let me know that's the last fight I'm ever going to have. And uh, my parents said school comes first. So it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't brought up for this person to fight, but I, when I fought, I wasn't one of those guys that went toe to toe and thank goodness, I try to protect myself. So if I was going to fight a big guy, I protected myself and I knew how to tie guys up. I, I didn't want to, you know, I'm not going to fight a guy six, five and, and go toe to toe. So I try to bring guys to me. In fact, when I got to Buffalo, finally Rick Dudley said he wanted me to play as a fourth liner. I scored, uh, I got hurt really bad, sprained my ankle. And I was out about 20 games, but I think I had 21 points in 60 games. And he told me, let people come to you. And that was great. Uh, but listen, hey, I'll be the first to tell you, going into playing the Flyers and they had seven guys that are over 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, yeah, I was losing sleep. That's not what I wanted to be, but I didn't mind doing it. And it, that's just the way it is. But hockey's not a, it's a part of the game. I always said it's a, it's a very, it is, it is a small part of the game, even back then and even more so now than ever. The game's a lot faster. Uh, you barely see any of that except the playoffs. There was a, there was a lot more, you know, physic, you know, there was a little bit more physical than you usually see, but, but back then it was just a lot of intimidation and that's just what I had to do. But I, fighting was just like a, I had to do it. <laughs> So, Mike, according to HockeyFights.com, you were in 133 tiffs, as they called. Do you remember who you fought the most? Well, Billy talks about Boston, but we it was the big rival. That year, we were in the Adams division. So you're playing the Boston Bruins and Montreal, Hartford, Quebec. You're playing those teams uh, eight times a year than playoffs. So we used to play the Bruins every year. So we had Larry Playfair at 6'5", and we had Clark Gillies was a big guy, and uh, we had Kevin McGuire, the toughest Irish guy I ever played with at 6'2". And they're picking on the, the little Jewish guys out there. So who, Jay Miller and Lyndon Byers and all those big boys are coming for me. It was a lot easier for, who are you going to go to fight those guys or come to me? So I ended up fighting Lyndon Byers and this guy, Bruce Shoebottom, a lot. And it was all good. They're, they're great guys. I've even talked to some of them uh, to this date. In fact, the funny thing was I went to visit my daughter at a camp years ago in Portland, Maine, and this, I walk into this restaurant with my brother, and the guy says, do you have ID? And I looked at him, I knew who it was. I said, ID, do you have a problem with me? And he looked at me, it was Bruce Shoebottom, and bought me drinks, and we became friends. So the fighting is just, like I said, a part of the game, but I would have to say, I fought Bruce and Lyndon Byers, and a lot of people, uh, that a lot of players from the Adams division, probably more so than, than anywhere. Hey, Steve, you want to show the clip? Oh, no. <laughs> Which one do you want me to play? You could play the first one. This is the person you fought five times, uh, five times in your career. But this team is good enough the way they play defensively and they uh -oh. get good goaltending to uh -oh. make something of it in the playoffs. Hartman off the faceoff, going at it with Shane, with Shane Churla. And Shane Churla is a big heavyweight. this year and leads the NHL in penalty minutes with 268. Mike Hoffman trying to get the helmet off Charlie. You know, he knows he's a little bit outmatched and Charlie really getting in some shots, but Harper's not going down. He's staying, he's taking a lot just to get in a couple and the crowd here loves it. You know, that was a perfect example. You didn't go toe to toe with him. You tried to tie him up. But I have one more question before I move on to Jeff. At the time, I, I looked at your record. You, you fought everybody, all these super heavyweights. Who was the heavyweight champion, do you think, in your, in your time frame? Oh, Bob Probert or Steve? Joey Pulitzer. Go ahead, Steve.
believe for a team that won 24 and lost only 12 last year. The fight going on over at the bench. It's Hartman and Probert. Looked like they may have been right in the middle of a line change. Probert not got that jersey buttoned down again. And Mike Hartman, the tough kid himself. is a tough kid and a game kid, but he's not in the category of a Bob Probert. He'll get high marks from his teammates just for taking on Probert. Okay, Steve. So, all I'm going to say is this, Mike, for 133 fights, you have the smoothest skin, you have no scars on your face, you must have been one smart fighter. That's all I got to say. Yeah, hold and Hold them tight and, don't, and hope Probert's jersey doesn't come off. Then you're in trouble. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, Jeff, I want to go on to you. You've worn a lot of hats in, in the Maccabi movement. Tell us a little bit more about your involvement with Maccabi World Union and the ice hockey and your involvement with Maccabi USA. First of all, seeing some of those fights reminds me of the other reason I decided to become an administrator and not an NHL hockey player. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, when I, when I had this – Maccabi experience in, in 1997 it really um you know I was sort of hooked and uh it's been a huge part of my life since then and you know as somebody who obviously is passionate about um athletics <clears throat> not just hockey but but all sports um and who you know has a strong Jewish identity it, it was a perfect fit for me and loves Israel and and uh the other thing that I haven't mentioned that um should have never taken me 54 minutes of this call to, to say but uh probably the, the, the best thing that happened to me on my trip in 1997 is that uh, I got engaged to my to my wife, Debbie, who's, uh, who many of the people on this call know and is a big part of Maccabi USA, is a board member and uh, co-chair of the development committee. Um, and uh, and so the two of us together, uh, you know, we're both, there, there you go, right? <laughs> one of us looks exactly the same and one of us doesn't. <laughs> I'll let you figure out who but that's a great shot. Yep, on the ice in Matula in 1997, and uh, we got engaged. About we stuck around Israel, traveled a little bit after the games, and um, got engaged at Hebrew University on Mount Scopus, overlooking the old city. And, um, and uh, at that point, also decided that we really wanted to to spend more time in Israel. And so, um, a few years after the Maccabiah, uh, we did a sabbatical. I, I took a year off from my job at UVM, and we lived. Um, in Israel for a year, and that sort of led me to reconnect uh, with the games. That so this was 2000, the year 2000, 2001, which was a it was a really challenging time in, in Israel. It was the middle of the Second Intifada. There was um, some really horrific terror uh, events that year, and there was a lot of discussion about whether the Maccabee was going to happen in 2001 or not. And, I, and we were living there at the time, and I was in touch. Um, uh, with the, the leaders of Maccabi USA, Jordan, and I see Bob Spivak, who's, who's on this call, and, and Ron and Jed Margolis at the time. And Debbie and I were just communicating to them that, you know, as challenging as, as it was in Israel, um, we were having an amazing experience still. And as Billy was talking about, sometimes what we see from on, on the news is not really what, what you're, you experience when you're in that country. And so we were in touch with the with Maccabi USA leadership and just saying that we're here, we're in Israel. You know, we love Maccabi, we love Israel. And if there's anything we can do to be involved, we'd love to help. And the decision was made to go ahead with, with the games in 01. And, um, and Debbie and I both became part of the management team. We worked with Jed Margolis, who many people know. And um, that was our first sort of connection at a, at a leadership level. And uh, We've both taken on a variety of different roles since then. We've brought our kids to, to the games. We have three kids, Theodore, who's 18, Gabby, who's 15, and Marzi, who's 11 now. Um, they've sort of grown up with Maccabi. We've been to Pan Am games. I've been a team manager at a few games. I'm now involved in um, the International Sports Committee. So it's been, it's a huge part of my life, and it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about and, and love dearly. Thanks, Jeff. So, Billy, uh, other than 1997, you came back as the uh, open team head coach in uh, 13 and 17 as a coach and player on the Masters team. Tell us about some of your highlights in these last two games. Well, um, I'll tell you that between Jeff Shulman, uh, Phil 
Devra, the pulley that are on the call, um, those people, I, you know, I went back because of them. I mean, Shu is my longest connection. Phil and Devra, I've gotten to know since 13 and actually 2012. And they've been spectacular to me. And there's been other great people too, obviously, but those are my closest connection. And they asked if I'd come back for 13 to be the, the open coach. I think I was asked if I really, if I wanted to play too. And I'm like, no, done. No way. Thank you. Um, and that was, that was, that was great. I mean, it was back up Matula. I couldn't go for the entire time, Jeff. So it was, it was a little different for me there, but the team itself was awesome. Uh, Woody Levin is on the call right now. And, uh, uh, you know, he was one of the leaders of the team and just to go back there. And again, the way that, that, that Phil and Deborah treated me and, and just got, and it just, they made me feel comfortable right away. And the team itself, going back as a coach, you have more, uh, more, uh, uh, responsibility, um, more, uh, you know, you have to be, I don't, you know, you, you just, it's a different way of viewing it, Jeff. And so it was awesome. And it was intense again, and Canada was great. I mean, Canada was another great, great team. I had a ton of fun with Guy Carboneau, and Primo was there, and, and awesome guys, and there's others too. And um, But you see it differently, and it gave me kind of that perspective of going as an adult, so to speak, versus as a young adult, you know. Um, going back in 17 as a player coach, uh, I figured, well, Hardy did it. I'll, I'll do it, I'll, but I'm going to do it with the old guys. Um, the, the masters as they generously call it. I, you know, I, the older and slower guys um, was awesome. I, I called myself Reg Dunlopowitz. That was my nickname going back as the player coach. Um, and then having other guys there too, that had been associated with the team. Aaron Vicker came, although he kept his pads, at, his goalie pads at home and came as a D man. And so we had great times there. That was special. The most reason, the biggest reason that was special for me is because all of my family was there in 17 and that's just you know as the kids would say maybe not anymore but that's sick you know that's awesome to have everybody there in that environment and and that um unity and the guys on the i mean the the, the third there was pressure because the 2013 team won the gold medal the masters i i think glick is on here and 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 they won the masters gold and uh, unfortunately, we didn't, but we still had an amazing time. We got ourselves into a with a great group of guys. Awesome, you know, still friends with many of them too. And 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 you know what it ends up being, Jeff? It's three different experiences, but with the same reason. Meaning, you're going there for hockey in the sense of that's what brings us all together. But it gives you three different ways of viewing it, and so that was what made it. That was what made it really unique for me. That's great, Billy. Thank you. So, Mike, from, from fighting Bob Probert, we're going to go to something that's probably one of the best moments. Tell us about your year with the Rangers that ended up with the Cup. Well, that was a great year. Uh, I'm, I'm friends with a, a lot of the players to this date. I worked with the Rangers the last three years, which was a, was a lot of fun for me doing the alumni work, especially being in uh, the New York area doing the 25th uh, anniversary. They had me doing a lot of different events. Uh, really through Adam Graves and Stepan Mateau, who I talked to Stepan Mateau about two times a week, three times a week now. And we're, we're very close. And, and just going back, I look at it where we had a really good team. And Mike Keenan at the end said, you know, we're going to keep the guys that we want to keep around. And they got rid of Phil Bork, who was a Stanley Cup champion. They got rid of a lot of good players like Dougie Waite, you know, or Tony Amani. Sorry, Tony Amani was there. Mike Gartner. And I was still on that team. And they could have easily gotten rid of me. Uh, and they had guys like Eddie Olchuk who scored 40 goals in, uh, in Toronto and maybe 38 goals in Chicago. And Doug Litzler was the captain of the Vancouver Canucks. And these guys were sitting out. So we just, uh, we, we, we formed a really good bond together because we're together every single day, all of the guys. And I played 35 games that year, almost lost my eye. That was the worst part. I think I lost 15, 20 games to injury and hurt my back, but <clears throat> Didn't play uh, towards the end, but it was a really a dream come true to you know have your name on the Stanley Cup. You have a Stanley Cup ring, and I played with these guys that I looked up to as a kid, like Mark Messier and McTavish and Kevin Lowe and Glenn Anderson. And I really said, like, what am I doing here? <laughs> I really said that. I sat there and said, what am I still doing here? And uh, 
So I was very fortunate and it was a privilege just to be a part of that team. And they, the, what an organization to this day, they take care of you beyond uh, your wildest imagination. So I was proud to be a part of it. Uh, and at the end, even prouder when they, uh, when they added my name to the Stanley cup, cause you had to play 40 games at that time. And I think I played, like I said, 35 and the same with Eddie O. So it was just fortunate and really it was a dream come true just to be a part of it. That's awesome. Now you mentioned that you, it was what a thrill it was to get the ring and get the name on the cup. By the way, was that Eddie Olchuk or is that you, that picture? Oh, that was me. That was you. Do you still have that shirt? That's a good question. I got mine. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Pulled it out of the closet. So you mentioned getting your name on the cup, but from what I heard, you almost didn't get your name on the cup. You want to tell us about that? Well, yeah. So what, what happened was you needed to play 40 games or one game in the finals back then to, to get your name on the Stanley Cup. And I didn't, I didn't play towards, towards the end, and I played 35 games. Uh, was there every, every day. Uh, you play, you practice, you're in and out of the lineup, you do whatever you can to be part of the team. And uh, at the end, Eddie Olchuk and myself did not get our name on the Stanley Cup. And, and Mark Messier who was one of the best leaders I've ever been around in my life, business. I work with a lot of different companies to this date, Fortune 50, Fortune 500. There's not a better leader in person than him. And there was guys like even Mike Gartner, who wasn't even on the team, fought for us to get our name on the cup. Neil Smith was another one. And they said, listen, these guys miss games uh, you know, throughout the year, but we want their name on the cup. And Adam Graves and a lot of people really pulled for us. And we had the lockout year that year. And it wasn't until uh, we had the ESPY Awards and they mentioned it at the ESPY Awards that we have the Stanley Cup, but there's two additional names on it. I was ready to cry. I said, Wow. And then guys like, you know, you had Kevin Lowe that went to bat for you and all these guys that I grew up just trying to emulate here, they are taking care of you. And they're just, that's what it takes to win a championship. But we talk a lot about, I listen to everybody's experience in Israel and, and Billy going back there and really for the, what's, that's what sports is all about. And uh, it, it puts a chill down me sometimes that these really good, not just quality athletes, these really good people went to bat for you. And, uh, Got my name on the Stanley Cup. Where well, you know where it says made in China? It's right there. No, I'm just kidding. But it's uh, it's there. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah. As a Ranger fan, that was a great moment for me and for my son and my daughter too. So Jeff, I want to ask you, you went from being playing at UVM uh, to being a proud alum, to associate athletic director, to finally achieving this dream job of director of athletics. Tell us about your journey. Tell us about the pressure of being a uh, an athletic director for a Div One school, especially that's hockey crazy. I'd like to hear about that. Sure. I mean, I, I feel just um, incredibly lucky to be uh, doing what I'm doing, and obviously, you know, I'm saying that during a time that's challenging, no matter what line of work you're in. Um, certainly, in the higher ed space right now, in the college athletics world, we were talking before before this started, just about how difficult the year it's it's been. But uh, you know, to be able to um, to be in this role at my alma mater and in a place that I that I love and work with amazing student athletes and colleagues in a, in a great part of the country. I just, I feel really lucky. And I've been at UVM, it's hard to believe, but 27 years, you know, I, I came, went to school here, left for a few years, came back. And, you know, I thought I'd stay in the athletic department for four or five years and get my master's and move on. And I, uh, you know, I just, I've never left other than that one year sabbatical in Israel. And, uh, did it knowing that there, there, I may not ever become the athletic director, but it worked out for me. And I'm now in my fifth year in this role. And, um, you know, there's, there's challenging parts of the work, but um, I don't take it for granted ever. And I, I just I feel incredibly lucky to do it. And, and you know, to, to be honest, the, the, the connection with Maccabi is something that's also incredibly special for me. And I just, I feel such a sense of gratitude towards this, this organization for what it, the incredible work that it does and the great friendships that that I've made along the way and you know with you Jeff and all uh, so many people I don't I don't want to start naming names but that are on this call and um yeah I just I feel really incred incredibly lucky and I also want to uh, Billy mentioned Phil and, and Deborah Pulley I want to be sure to give them a shout out to they've been a huge part of Maccabi hockey as the as the chairs uh in 2013 and 17 again coming up in 22 and we they've done an incredible job sort of growing the program not just open but juniors now and masters and we're gonna have women uh at the games in 22 so 
Um, yeah, no, I'm, I love UVM. I love Maccabi, and, and uh, it's been fun talking with everybody tonight. So, Jeff, one last question for you is that you sit on the, the NCAA Division I Men's Hockey Committee. What are some of the goals or changes that you want to see in your tenure? I want to see UVM get back in the NCAA tournament. That's why I'm not. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no it's, um, I mean, it's a really interesting year. We've been, you know, we've had several meetings now trying to figure out how we're going to do uh, tournament selections. But college hockey is, is just incredibly special. We talked about Michigan and Yost Arena and Gutterson Fieldhouse, where we play up here at Vermont. You know, I think about uh, line of rink where Cornell plays and there's just, it's such, there's such great energy. And I just think all of us who are part of the college hockey community, and Billy's a huge part of it, a huge advocate. We just want to see college hockey uh, put its best foot forward and get the kind of love and attention in the college hockey and the college athletic world that it, that it deserves. And, uh, and that's, you know, in my, in my role on this committee, not only do we, we pick, the, um, pick the team for the tournament, we pick the sites for the tournament, um, but we're also, we're trying to promote the game and, and try to um, really take it, uh, you know, more national and get more attention through, through media. And there's things we can do as a game. We've instituted the three on three overtime this year and shootouts, which I think are going to be really good. And um, so that, those are the types of things that, that we're involved in, but it's fun to, fun to be engaged in, in that kind of leadership role for sure. Thanks, Jeff. So before we wrap up, I just want to say that when I do these programs, Sometimes at 8.20, I'm afraid that I'm going to be out of questions and, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Very rarely do we go over time like we have here and we could go longer. But I think it's pretty much time that you know, people want to get going, want to wrap up. But I want to ask each of you, we'll start with Billy, just anything you want to say, one last thing about your involvement with the Maccabi USA or the Maccabi movement, the Maccabi movement. Uh, obviously, very thankful um, that the people have had the, uh, the trust in me and the, uh, the, the desire to have me come back and to be associated with many amazing people. Uh, you know, Shu and I, we can, we can go an awful long time without talking, but whenever we talk, it's awesome. I go through a wall for the guy. Love him. He's hugely involved, by the way, getting, helping get uh, the uh, new rink uh, put into the uh, arena in Jerusalem. We were able to connect with the NHL ice guy and he helped then via Jeff to another guy in Israel buy a couple of hundred grand, literally a whole ice making thing. And we had ice hockey there. And that did change the, um, it changed the tone for me. It did. Playing in Jerusalem made a big difference. Not that Matula wasn't great, but as Jeff said much earlier, it was out there a bit. So I, I, I highly encourage them to continue playing ice hockey, whether it's in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. And what did you, what did they have, Jeff? Like eight or 9,000 or whatever oh, yeah. it was for that. Yeah, that, that, that yeah, exactly. I mean, it was it was crazy for the Open Championship and a real testament to Canada and the U.S. Bring, you know, putting on a great show at the elite level, the Open Division there. Overall, listen, Jeff, I, I've, I've really, I mean, more than enjoyed my time being part of, of the World Maccabee Games. Um, they're special to me. I told you I have a jersey on my wall that my sister Lisa gave me as a gift. My buddy Steve Cohen gave me this. And it wasn't put up here for... For this event, it was it's always been up there of myself and three or four of the other old guys, the captains from that 17 team. Um, so hockey has been really good to me in my life. It's brought me to a lot of fun, interesting places. I can tell you it has never, I didn't never thought it would bring me to uh, playing in Israel, uh, sitting in hammocks at, you know, 12 o'clock at night or outdoor bars enjoying it because of hockey. You know, I mean, I, I never would have thought that. So to me, the ability to do that via hockey is very special. And uh, look, you never know. There's, uh, you know, hopefully we get rid of this COVID crap soon and we can keep having these things and there's more opportunities to do stuff. And I've got a son um, who's big into hockey and um, maybe in a couple of years, Hardy can coach. I'll be his assistant. Shu can run it. And uh, we'll just, we'll, we'll let them go at it. Thanks, Billy. Mike, how about you? Well, it, it, I'm going to reverse it a little bit because I, I, I lived in, uh, like I said, in Hoboken and I did an event this past year and I'll tell you where I'm going with this. I did an event and there were, uh, it was a Jewish event in, uh, in, uh, in New Jersey and it was for, uh, I, I can't even remember the name of the event. It was for raising money for a, a family that had, any family that had cancer, it was taken care of and there were hundreds of Jewish players and these kids were good. 
I was there. I went, I went with Glenn Anderson, actually. The Rangers sent us there. And I thought, okay, we're going to go to this uh, Jewish event. And I was wrong again. So if you're a Jewish hockey player, a Jewish athlete, it's a dream to play in the Maccabees. And I highly recommend it. Back in, in the day, I had to convince, come on, Billy, come. I know you just got done playing hockey. Come on, Jeff, we need you there. But nowadays, it shouldn't even be a sell. And there was, like I said, I went to this tournament and there was hockey players with sitzes and yarmulkes and playing hockey. And, and back in my day in Detroit, I could think of maybe 10 of us that played competitive hockey, maybe, maybe. And I don't know about Chicago for Billy or in Buffalo uh, with Jeff. And now I see so many Jewish hockey players and that's what I love. And I can only encourage them to, if they have that opportunity to even try out is still to be a big part of it because I don't know if everybody makes it. So if, if any of them, if, so if you ever need me to, it should even be a sell nowadays. It should be, wow, you, the experience we had way back in 97 and look, and I could tell each year it's, it's only escalating and getting better. I recommend if you're a Jewish hockey player, I don't care what level you are because that year we had kids, uh, Jeff Schulman, uh, you know, University of Vermont with the Boston Bruins and Billy Jaffe, Division I hockey player and Justin Duberman. And we had, uh, I remember, I think David Heimowitz it was the captain of Boston College back then. And uh, Justin Kearns was a captain of Northeastern. And look at the hockey players there. Those, and, and we went and we had fun. And now I recommend every Jewish player, I hope it's taped, to go to the tryouts, have fun with it, get involved, because it's, it's something that has, you could see we're the old guys now and it has, it has stuck with us for so many years. So that's probably what I, how I feel inside. And it's so great to see so many Jewish hockey players. I hope everybody takes advantage of being involved with the Maccabees one day. Thanks, Mike. And Jeff? Um, you know, I, I said it before, you know, I, I love, I've loved my, uh, you know, my experience as an athlete in, in the Maccabee and I've loved my involvement uh, leadership role since then and it's just a really really special organization and I think you know hopefully the, the I think my, the hockey Maccabi hockey is a great example of what makes Maccabi so special is that it brings it brings young people who are um, who are high level athletes who have grown up in most cases with their Jewish identity being totally separate from anything to do with sports and athletics and to play at a high level these days, it's not easy to do a lot of the things that that um, that contribute to a strong sense of Jewish identity. You know, Jewish day schools and Jewish summer camps. It's not you know if you're playing competitive sports at the youth level, it's not easy to be involved in those types of things. And so, Maccabi um, does an amazing job of bringing those two things together. Um, and and to have Israel as a backdrop is obviously incredible. And um, you know, I've talked to a lot of hockey players over the years trying to encourage them to participate. And sometimes they'll say, no, I need to train this summer. I can't be gone for three weeks. And, and everyone who, who's made the decision to go to a person tells, tells me it's the greatest thing they've ever done. And so, I, you know, I couldn't agree more with what Mike said and Billy that um, we've got to continue to, to spread the word and Phil and Deborah are involved in this. And all of us, you know, who, who love Maccabi, who love Israel, who love hockey, who love whatever sport it is. Uh, need to, to spread to spread the word about Maccabi. It's an amazing organization that does incredible things. So, thanks, Jeff. So, Billy, Mike, and Jeff, you guys are the faces of Maccabi USA Hockey. But one one of the things I've learned in sports is sometimes it's the faces behind the scenes that really make a, ma a major impact. People like Josh Peterson or Steve Cohen and Deborah Shore and Phil Pulley, as you mentioned. Jeff, did you get into my notes again? Because you mentioned them before I did. So, I just want to say a big shout out to them. Uh, guys, this was great. One of the most enjoyable programs. And as we blow out the candles on the show, I think now our CEO, Marshall Einhorn, is going to light the Hanukkah candles. How's that for a segue, Marshall? That's a, a, that's a good one, Jeff. Well, uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, Billy, uh, and Mike for a great show uh, as we celebrate uh, the holiday where the Maccabees, our holiday, brought light into the world. Certainly fitting to, to end our year at Maccabi USA at home with the three of you and the great story of uh, bringing ice hockey uh, to the games and back to the games. And we look forward to seeing everyone in 2022. So if you have a Hanukkah nearby, invite you to light it. If not, uh, feel free to join in. My family's coming in with me. If I can get them on screen, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll start another one here. We'll have, of course, um, 
Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kishanu B'mitzvotav, Vetzivanu L'Hadliknem, Shelchanu Kav. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Sheasa Nisim Lavoteinu, Bayamim Hahem Bazman Hazem. Happy Hanukkah. Thanks, Mark.